Hi and welcome to the Peak Endurance Podcast. My name is Isabel Ross and I'm the coach at Peak Endurance Coaching. <coughs> Episode 84 is an interview with Catra Corbett. Now before she was an ultra runner, Catra was a drug addict, a hairstylist, a go-go dancer, a daughter and a friend to many, which I'm sure she still is. The drugs led her to drop out of high school, developing, develop an eating disorder and damage her relationship with her family. Catra eventually found herself in jail and that was the start of her turnaround. In 1996, two years after becoming clean and sober, Catra started to dig herself out of a pretty dark hole and she did, she did this by starting to exercise by lifting weights and walking. She had never particularly liked running when she was a kid but her dad, who died unexpectedly when Catra was 17, had instilled a, an idea in her mind about how long distance runners can work through all kinds of emotional and physical pain and accomplish truly remarkable things in the process. One day she just started running and clearly she hasn't stopped because decades later Catra is one of the few people who has completed more than 100 100 mile races. She runs every single day which we talk about in the podcast and it has completely transformed her life. Are injuries or ongoing niggles causing running to be painful and ruining your enjoyment of your sport? If so, get on top of these now so that you can enjoy running again and get back to preparing for the upcoming race season. Fingers crossed everything goes ahead. Come in and see the specialists at Health and High Performance where they utilise the latest in technology and experience to help you get back to your running best. So. Head to healthhp.com.au forward slash run to book an appointment and ensure you can run strong and free. You can also find them on Instagram, Health High Performance, where they um, regularly post great informative videos on how to stay strong for running. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast. Rating, reviewing and subscribing helps the podcast to grow and more runners like yourself find it. If you do enjoy this episode, and I'm sure you will because Catra is awesome, please do go on over and rate and review. I am aiming for 100 reviews by Easter next year. Will you help me achieve my goal? Tim Caddy is helping. He wrote, I have started listening while running or driving. Great content and guests and have learned many good tips over the past few months. I particularly like advice on training, nutrition and events. Hope to do GSER one year. I now look forward to each episode. My only bleat would be the sound quality is sometimes poor. Keep up the good work, Izzy. Thanks, Tim, for the review. I'm sure you will achieve your goal of getting into GSER. It's a tough race, that's for sure, but a great one to do. In regards to the sound quality, this is often beyond my control and I'm always doing the absolute best I can to give you the highest quality podcast that I can. I really appreciate your understanding. I'm loving being able to run freely in time and, and in where I can go now and knowing that there are races ahead. If you want to get the most out of your training, email me, isabel at peakendurancecoaching.com.au to organise an individualised and structured training plan. In the meantime, enjoy the interview with Catra. There we go. Hi Catra and welcome to the Peak Endurance Podcast. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. No worries. Now, I normally ask my guests at the beginning to tell me about themselves and how they got into running, just sort of as an introductory question. But for you, that is actually the main question, I find. So <laughs> in saying that, can you tell the listeners about yourself and how you got into running? Sure. I actually grew up hating running, <laughs> but I got clean and sober 26 years ago and I started working out in a gym and I got bored with, you know, just walking. And one day I decided to start running. So I basically just the, the route that I used to walk, that was three miles each day. I decided to run it one day and it went on from there. <laughs> so you actually ran that whole three miles the first time you tried mm -hmm. it? The first time. Yeah. And I did within uh, less than two weeks, I signed up for my first race, which was a 10 oh, K. Wow. And then on my car was a, flyer for the San Francisco marathon, which was in three months. So I had three months to train for a marathon when I just started running. <laughs> oh, wow. And so did you, uh, were you like many or a lot really beginner runners who got injured straight away? <laughs> no, I never got injured. Oh, wow. I've, I've been, yeah, I've been very, very lucky. I've had 
you know, aches, you know, aches and pains here and there, but mm. nothing that's ever taken me out of running other than pulling a calf muscle. Like I want to say like nine years ago, but that was only like for seven days I couldn't run. And, oh, but okay, yeah. No, no, nothing ever, no injuries from running really. <laughs> I've been yeah. very lucky. And so, lifting weights and other stuff like that. Yes, I've been injured, oh, but not yeah. from running. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. What, what do you think has kept you injury free? I think it has a lot to do with my vegan diet and the way I eat and try to avoid inflammation causing foods and eat pretty much a clean diet and taking really good, clean vegan supplements. So I've been yep. doing that ever since I started running. I've always been a vegan before I even started running. So, uh, okay. just, you know, doing stuff for preventative, um, you know, lifting weights to make sure that, you know, working on my core for strength, you know, cause that's really important. A lot of people have weak cores and weak hamstrings and things like that. And that's how they end up getting injured. So just focusing on those areas and always making sure, you know, to be lifting weights and mm. adding core training. And as I'm getting older, it's like, you have to do more of that just to make sure. So I can continue running until I'm a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's my plan too. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, a, a lot of runners are hesitant about doing strength training. So I'm really glad to hear you say that, um, that it's an important part of your program. Yeah, it always has. Even before I started running, I was working out in the gym when I got clean and yeah. sober. So that was kind of my yeah. thing. And then, like I said, I, I lift weights here because of COVID. Obviously, all of our gyms are closed right now. We're back on like shut down stuff here. Uh, but, yeah. Um, yeah. But luckily, yeah. I live like where we have huge wilderness areas. So, you know, you're, they're encouraging people to get out and run and exercise, you know, just not in large groups. But I can social distance all day long. I can run a hundred miles out here and see nobody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's, that's the beauty of our sport, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> and so um, how did that first 10 K go? Was it, do you obviously enjoyed it if you considered doing a marathon straight after? Actually, <laughs> I, I didn't know anything about pacing or, you know, <laughs> so I ran really, really, really fast and I felt like I was going to throw up when I finished. So um, when I did have the, when I got to my car, I, I was excited though that I ran, like I did yeah, yeah. something. It felt really good. I felt those endorphin buzzes and I, it was like, wow, I accomplished something. Yeah. You know, you got a medal. It, it was a big deal, you know, having been clean and sober only a couple of years and just, you know, doing something for myself like that. It, it really felt good. And so when I did find that flyer on my car, I ended up buying um, a marathon training book and I had to skip ahead to <laughs> three months out because yeah. I was like, okay, it's, it's a six month training, but I'm, uh, I got to skip ahead till, to, you know, three months out. So it said to um, do a nine mile long run and at that time, there was no GPS no, <laughs> or anything yeah. like that. This is back in 96. So I got in my car and I pushed the odometer and I drove four and a half miles out. So I knew yeah. exactly that's where I would turn around and come back home. So I would know where the nine miles yeah. was. So the next day I did that and felt really good. And then just started the training from there. And, you know, each, each time I went further, I felt better. So it was, you know, I just felt really good. And oh, I felt awesome. like I was accomplishing something. And then, of course, even in the middle of the marathon, I was already deciding on which neck was going to be my next marathon. So, <laughs> yeah. And so, so how did that there? And how did that marathon go? Yeah, it really good. I mean, at the end, I would say the last two miles, my legs felt really stiff and heavy. Yeah. I was like, okay, this must be hitting the wall, <laughs> you know, that these people talked about. So I finished and it just, you know, just coming into Kizar Stadium in San Francisco, you know, and everybody in the crowd, it just, you know, you felt like an elite athlete. I mean, <laughs> I didn't have anything to compare it to because I didn't yeah. ever run before. So it was pretty exciting. And so I immediately signed up for a marathon after that too. Good for you. It did feel really stiff the next day and I was like, yeah. that's okay. You know, it's like, get back at it. And so I did another marathon like two months later. Oh, wow. So, you must be yeah. very, you must be good at recovery. <laughs> I am actually. <laughs> so um, the first or the second year I started, I decided I wanted to run all the marathons in California and some of them were on trail because they oh, had yeah. all these smaller marathons. So that was my induction, introduction to trail running. So the second year I started running all these different marathons and my very first time I ran a trail race, I was like, 
oh my God, this is nothing like a marathon. <laughs> There's no water, you know, no water every mile. Like it, it in the, when I talked to the race director, cause back then you just filled out like an application and sent a check and there was no internet and to be able to read up on stuff. So you just went back and forth with the race director calling them. And he's like, you got to carry a, you know, a water bottle and, you know, a waste pack or something. So I went out and got one of those. And so we had, I think, aid about every six or seven miles. There was like, two, it was two loops. So it was like two um, aid the, yeah. each loop. So, but yeah, I'd never run on a trail before. So it was totally different. You know, it's like I, all these obstacles, but I absolutely loved it. So then I started doing a bunch more trail races because they were part of the marathons I was trying to complete and yeah. ended up not running every marathon in California. There was just too many at the time, but the bigger <laughs> ones, I ran all the bigger ones and started doing the trail stuff. And I would hear people talking when I was running these trail marathons about ultra marathons. And I was like, Oh, Hey, what are they talking about? 30, 50 K. And I'm like, how far is that? And they're like, it's 31 miles. And I was like, Oh, I can do that. Cause at this point I'm doing back to back marathons. Like sometimes I did oh, a I Saturday can. marathon and a Sunday marathon. So I was like way ahead of the game of training. <laughs> so yeah. I decided to sign up for a 50 K and I actually, before I even ran the 50 K, I ran 50 K in training <laughs> just because oh, I wanted okay. to make sure I was going to be okay. <laughs> so, but the race was nothing like that. Let me tell you my first 50 K, which was the, came the second year of running ultras. Um, I mean, marathons okay. yeah. was 105 degrees uh-huh. and I knew nothing about like salt or, you know, like I didn't know about, you know, how to eat like in yeah. marathons, you don't yeah. eat, you do like yeah. maybe one gel and that's it. But you're out a little bit longer in a 50 K, especially if you're in like climbing and stuff. So yeah. I finished that and I was like, oh my God, that was the hardest thing I ever did. But immediately again, I'm si- I signed up like two weeks later for a 50 mile or so. <laughs> so obviously you like doing really hard things. Yeah. So, well, yeah, I guess I didn't have anything to compare to and yeah. I didn't know anybody that ran because I got rid oh, of God. all my friends when I got clean and sober. So I hung out with a couple of people and they weren't runners. And I mean, they worked out in the gym with me and one of them was my good friend, Kevin, but he wasn't into running, but he was supportive of, supportive of my running. And so it would come out to my races, but oh, that's good. so I had nobody to compare it to and, or to talk to about it. So I just kept signing up for whatever. And, and I guess those, so mis- within, those little mistakes, <laughs> that, that, that's all how you learn anyway, isn't it? Exactly. So I did a 50 miler and then I did another 50 K and then another 50 miler. And this is all within like a three month period, I think less than that. Mm-hmm. Less than that, actually. <laughs> and so it was a raining, pouring rain, like worse weather conditions. Like they let you, you know, the race director was like, if you want to drop from the 50 miler, you can drop yeah. to the 50K. And I was like, no, I'm going to do this. So in the, as we started, it was dark and I had to have a flashlight and it was coming down. And I just thought to myself, if I finish this, I'm going to run a hundred miler. So I got through it. I finished it. It was super hard. And so I immediately signed up for a hundred miler. <laughs> Oh, that's and that's funny. how my running has been. It's like, <laughs> you know, I did that 100 miler and it was the worst experience of my life. I felt oh, really? blistered feet. Like I said, back then you didn't, there was no internet. Now yeah. we have so many resources and so much yeah. help. We can communicate with one another. And it was like, I definitely learned the hard way, which is, which is good. That's how I have always learned things. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, yeah. that's just my personality. And so it's like, I, if I could do it, anybody can do it. So <laughs> got through it. And, and I was just, and immediately that was my thing. I was like, I want to go far. I like going far. It's a challenge, you, you know, cause people are like, Oh, it gets so easy. You run over a hundred, hundred mile or, yeah. you know, 130 or whatever. And I'm like, no, it's, it's, it it's always a different challenge. Sometimes yeah. it could be easy, but you don't, you have to, be you're humbled by each experience because sometimes it could be easy, but don't expect that the next time, you know, it's a Mm. different race, a different set of circumstances, you know, you don't ever know what's going to happen. And that's why I like the 200 milers. Those are my favorite distance. (laughs) So now that is a whole different ball game. And how many of (laughs) those have you done? Yeah, I have done 15 200s now. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I'm, so we have what's called the triple crown here and That's it's right. uh, three races. So it's Bigfoot, which is in Washington, um, Tahoe, which is in Tahoe, and then yeah. Moab 240, which is in Utah. 
And so it, you get a special award for doing all three and they're all a month apart. And so I've done it twice and this year, well, next year I'm signed up for, hopefully we'll have all three of the races yeah. for the third time. And nobody's, there's, I think, no, nobody's done it three times. Just me and a guy have both done it twice. So I'll be the first person to go for the triple, triple crown. Oh, awesome. Good so, luck with that. That's, that's Yeah, excellent. thank you. Yeah, I like yeah. that. And so for people who maybe don't know your story, which I'm sure most people do, but I'm maybe here in Australia, some don't. When you talk about um, becoming clean and sober, did you want to just tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Sure. So I was a party girl, um, hanging out in the clubs, hated exercise. I worked in a hair salon. So I was, you know, into hanging out in goth clubs, com you know, completely opposite of how I look now. I was like black, long hair, white, white skin kind of thing. Mm. So I got arrested and I spent two nights in jail and basically got scared straight. I went into, I was lucky enough that the judge allowed me to go into an outpatient program because I had never been in trouble. I had a job. And so I was going to AA or NA, which is Narcotics Anonymous or Alcoholics Anonymous. And I chose to go to Narcotics Anonymous because at that time I was obviously more into drugs than drinking. But yeah. I mean, regardless, I had an addiction. I, if I had just stopped doing the drugs, I would have been drinking as well. So, so I went through an outpatient program, got therapy, went through, a th went to a therapist and, you know, worked on myself and, and, you know, be, decided I was going to completely change my life. And that's why I was vegetarian since I was nine years old. And that's when, once I got sober, I was like, I'm going vegan too. So and, and why, why vegan? You wanted to just cleanse the whole body or? Well, I was already wanting to go vegan. So yeah. growing up, I stopped eating beef when I was a little girl because we raised uh, cattle and I had one that I named and his name was Charlie. And my parents are like, those are not pets. They're not pets. Well, one day my brother, you know, we had a meat freezer in the garage and he opened up the freezer and it was totally full because we'd have, you know, we'd get our cows slaughtered and put them in the, yeah. you know, whichever one we decided. And Charlie was in there. My brother opened up the freezer oh. and he's all, Charlie's in the freezer. And I, did, you know, I was nine years old and I was like, no, he's not. And then oh. I realized he was no longer there. And my parents were like, why did you tell her that? Oh, no. <laughs> you know? So, and then raising lambs, I was in this, uh, or, organization called 4-H. So it's kids and you raise animals, you know, and I was raising a lamb and then realizing once I sold it at the fair that somebody was going to be on their dinner table. Mm -hmm. So I, it dawned on me, like after I sold him, I was like, oh, you know, and I raised him for a whole year. And then my parents were like, oh God, this is just not good. So then I stopped eating lamb. And so it kind of went from there. So just growing up, I mean, I did eat cheese and dairy, and, but I pretty much ate maybe just fish and chicken once in a while. So, yeah. and my parents were fine with it. They're like, what can we do? You know? <laughs> yeah. No, no, <laughs> I was a very I can sensitive kid that. growing yeah. up like that. So when I got clean and sober, I decided just to co go completely vegan too, to, because I was on this path. Now I'm, you know, I want to be a better person, live cleaner and all of that. So I figured might as well do it now. So, and yeah. it gave me something to focus on because obviously I'm not going to the clubs. And yeah. so it gave me a lot to read up on and, and why I was doing it and, you know, to make the environment better, use le less water, things like that. So, Yeah. And how old were you at this stage? Uh, 27. Yeah. Yeah. And how old were you when you got into the ultra running then? So it was in 19, so I was 33 when I started running ultras. Yeah. Yeah, that's and so you say you've done more than a hundred hundred milers, but now yes. you're getting into the two hundred milers. Do you think you'll ever get to more than a hundred, two hundred milers? Oh, I've ran past. Oh, you mean two hundred and one hundred miles? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's in my head. I would like to yeah. get to fifty first. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, but it's doable. There's just not enough of those races, yes. and the recovery for those does take a lot longer because you're yeah. out. So they allow you like a hundred. 110 hours, I think it's Moab, which is 240 miles. So it does take a lot more out of you when you're doing it. So the recovering between, like when I'm doing the Triple Crown, I just run, you know, like I don't need to run more than 10 miles at a time in between. You know, it's like you're already trained. Yeah. If you get through one, you're just getting to the next one. So, yeah, I would like to, 
I would like to try to do as many as I can in a year once this COVID is yeah. gone and we can travel and do other things so I can go to some other countries and, and race. But I definitely would like to try to do like, I think the record, this guy did four, 13 or 15 in a year of 200. Oh, so that's a lot, I would yeah. like to try to do yeah, over that. that. Yeah, <laughs> we'll yeah, see. No, I, I hope you do. And um, yeah. so what's, what's for your mind, what's better or, you know, different, I guess, about the 200 miler compared to the 100 miler? So it's a lot more low key. And what I try to tell people, because people look at it like, if you've run 100 miles, which you have, you mm. think 100 miles and you're like, wow, running 100 miles and I have to run 100 miles again. In your <laughs> head, you're thinking that's hard. You know, yeah. it's hard enough pushing yourself in 100 miles and then you got to get up and do it again. Well, you don't run it like that because it's, it's, I always say, you don't say, oh, I'm going to run 200 miles as in two 100s. You say you're running 200 miles. You say it in a different way. Oh, and it's so different. Head, <laughs> it is like, oh, it's 200 miles. So you're not running your first 100 like you would run a 100 miler. Yeah. So in, when you do, which a lot of people do, and I see them like, you know, this year the only 200 that um, didn't get canceled was Moab 240 and that was in October. And there was a lot, you know, because people haven't raced at all and they were happy to be racing. There was a lot of new people that were making the jump in the 200 milers. And they all go out like they're running 100. I go, okay, we'll see you later. And day two, I'm like, everybody's lying and trying to sleep and, you know, they're, they've burnt themselves out. So you run it slower to be faster in those distances. You want to take it easy the first 24, 48 hours and then push you know, yeah. and make sure the, the thing with the 200s too, unless you're going to be winning the race and doing it really fast, like some of these very fast 200 mile runners are, you know, under whatever 50 hours, which is yeah. insane. And they're not yeah. sleeping. I mean, I can go for like 48 hours pretty much with not even a nap, but I need to get at least a three hour nap in there to be, you know, otherwise you're just dragging. Yes. And even if it's just 10 minutes here and there on the trail, you feel like you've slept an hour. If you just go lay down and tell your pacer, if you have a pacer or set your phone for 10 minutes, you wake up rejuvenated. And yeah. I always tell my pacer, like if I have somebody with me at night, I'm like, wake me up in seven minutes. And they're like, seven minutes. I go, it just, that's all I'm sleeping for. And I'll wake up in five and I'll be ready to go. And they're like, you were like falling asleep on your feet. And then five minutes, you're like, everything is fine. And it's just weird. Your, yeah. your mind starts going through a lot of stuff. And then, so, and it's a lot like fast packing. I tell people or backpacking, if you've gone backpacking and you do it light and fast with lighter gear and, you know, go out for multiple days at a time, which is, that's the term fast packing is. Mm -hmm. And I've done a lot of that. And so that's how I run it. Anybody that comes from that kind of background actually really excels because they're good at, pushing and hiking hot, hard up hills. And a lot of the 200s you're hiking. I mean, yeah. you're climbing a lot. So everybody's going to walk. Even the person that's winning, nobody's running every single step of the race. So, so you just have to train to hike really fast. I tell people that's the most important thing. And when I first moved to Bishop, since I, you know, I have like 14,000 foot summits close by that I can go and train on. Yeah. So when I moved here, I didn't train enough hiking. So the second year living here, which was last year when I did the triple crown, I did great in all of the races because I finally realized train, just hiking, go out yeah. some days and you can, I run down, but hike up and do it fast, do it with a purpose. And, mm. you know, once I got the hang of that, because I was such a slow, like hiker, like when you're tired and you're like yeah. swinging your arms, all of that is really important. So I got really good with my trekking poles and you utilizing the use poles. Yeah. 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 Most everybody does in 200. Yeah. And so, you know, it just helps, especially when you're tired. Like I may not pull them out until mile 50, but in the middle of the night, I like to have them. It just keeps my focus like, do, 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 you know, as you're going along, keeps your arms moving and, you know, just, it, it definitely helps when you're tired. So you're not yeah. stumbling too. <laughs> so how you upright. And how do you deal with the sleep deprivation? You said you can go for like 48 hours without, without sleeping. How do you deal with that? You just learn to deal with it. And I always, yeah. I always joke to people cause I, I was, 
into doing methamphetamine. So yeah. I was doing speed. So I was awake for three days. So I always say <laughs> I was training for these bad <laughs> men because I was very yeah. good at staying awake. And they go, so I don't get like crazy, crazy hallucinations like most people do early on and when they're out there. And I'm like, no, I was already doing that. <laughs> I was on drugs, but no, I just, I, I try to make sure I sleep at certain times. And I know if I don't, then that's when I start falling apart. If you do yeah. have like lack of sleep, you start going loony. Like you really think you're going the wrong way or yeah. something's following you, you know, it's like, and that's why it's important for people to go to sleep because you could go crazy out there. And Candace really point, you know, brings that point home to people. Like some of the best runners have caught into problems. And I got into problems at Bigfoot last year because of the lack of sleep. I couldn't sleep. I would get to the aid station and I was taking too much caffeine before mm -hmm. I got there. So I finally figured it out as after that race, I decided no caffeine three hours before I knew I'm having a planned sleep break. Otherwise yeah. I'm just sitting there and it's doing me not, no good if I'm not sleeping. So yeah, I was like stumbling around on the course. I convinced myself that she told us we had to climb over logs and go this different direction and not to follow the ribbons. That's how you get. It's oh, like wow. I knew and I'd snap back and I'm like, what are you doing? You know, like I'd come back and forth into yeah, reality. Yeah. And at one point I like gave up and I was like close to the aid station. And it was maybe 15 miles from the finish and like another three miles to the next aid station. And I took out my um, emergency blanket because you have to carry stuff like that in case you need to lay down. Yeah, yeah, so I enough. lay down and I was like, I'm quitting. They're going to have to come find me. <laughs> and then laying there, I'm like, nobody's going to come and find me for <laughs> a long time. You're going to be having to lay here yeah. until they realize there's a problem. So I would get back up and I started heading towards the direction I came knowing I was going that way and runners are coming out and they're like, you're going the wrong way. And I'm like, I know <laughs> it's just, that's why you need sleep. Yeah. So after that, I realized, yeah, that was, that it wasn't good. I mean, all the way even to the finish line, I was hallucinating. I thought my dog was with me. <laughs> I was like, this is not good. So I tried so to, you did finish it. Hours. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I finished it slower than I did the prior years because I didn't get the sleep, even yeah. though I was out there longer moving. I, it, because of that non-sleep, yeah. but you're like going back and forth with your brain, stopping and looking around and just like spacing out. So yeah. I, I try to sleep my, this is what I usually do. So I sleep, I try to make it to a mile 100 or sometimes the eight stations, maybe at 112 or 114. Yeah. I think it was in Moab. So I get to those sleep stations and then I'll sleep three hours, my first sleep break. And then my second sleep break, I usually, it's around 150 or 160. And if I need to sleep before then I'll, I'll like take 10 minute naps on the trail, but I try to sleep for another two hours. And for me, five hours is plenty enough. And you know, that amount of time and usually finishing around 80, three hours or whatever for the 200. So five hours of sleep in that period works for me. So, and you got to, I always tell people when you're training for those, go out all night and run and stay okay. awake all day and then do it again. And that's a good key on how you're going to be reacting mentally. But yeah, you just got to kind of figure it out as you go. There's no like book to it. You no. know, it's like, so you, so you recommend, um, training overnight and that sort of thing. I've, I've heard some people say, oh, you can't train sleep deprivation and that sort of thing. You feel you can. You can yeah. So if mm. you're, say you go to work all day, mm. if you, you know, you're working and then at night go out like at 10 o'clock at night to go for your run and then stay awake the whole next day and then do another night shorter run. And yeah. then you'll know how you're, you, you're feeling, you know, and, and, to getting used to the lack of it. And if you run hundreds, then you're, you know, most people are running through the night, you know, yes. if they're doing, you know, just under 30 hours or over 24 hours. So you're going, everybody's going through the night in a hundred, yeah. you know, most That's people. Right. Yeah. So that I just, I just say, if you can run a hundred and you do those as do a couple of them as training runs for your 200, just, yeah. you got to learn to hike fast. That's all just yeah. throw hiking in there. So yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good to know about the, about the hiking. Um, and so obviously you're out there for quite a while and you have to have a crew. Do you have generally the same crew or do you kind of try to? I usually do. Or? Yeah, I have the same like six or eight people that I use. And, you know, I have a pretty good core of like four people that I really like. And they know how to 
deal with me. I don't even have to say anything and they know what I'm going to need and what I'm going to do. And I don't necessarily have crews at all my 200, like Bigfoot, which is the hardest one. I never have a crew or pacers just because it's logistically, it's a nightmare. Oh, like okay. Your crew is driving like 500 or 800 miles oh, wow. to crew you in this race just because of the mountain range, how it is. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't want anybody out there. That's kind of a nightmare. And then these roads are just really windy, narrow, like logging roads. I'm like, I don't want to worry about it. And, and even the when aid I have stations, a crew, yeah, and the aid stations, they are have good, everything. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. And they have sleep stations, but this year, because of the COVID, it changed. So we had to ha- have um, a drop bag where we had that moved to each sleep station. So oh, you could okay. have a tent in there, sleeping oh. bag, a bigger drop bag, and they called it the sleep station drop bag. So each time you got to your sleep station, say you didn't even need to sleep there, you can just send it and put it in the pile and say, take it to the next one. So they would bring it, move it around to the sleep station. So wherever yeah. you needed to sleep, it was there. So that is, that's going to be the new norm, I, I would imagine, for forever for these races, just because yeah. you can't put a bunch of people together. And yeah. when I do have a crew, I go in my vehicle. And But I always, I'm one of these people that no matter what, people are like, why are you putting drop bags out there? You have a crew. And I said, I know they're going to meet me everywhere, but what that's if the just car breaks down? What yep. if there's an accident? What if the, mm. I, that's going to put in a, especially in a 200 mile race that could take you out of the race because you yeah. won't have your gear. What if you need a rain jacket, a Gore-Tex rain pants? It's lightning and thundering, you know, and, and that's yeah. happened. I mean, that happened at Bigfoot last year, like a huge thunder and lightning storm. Oh, okay. But obviously I had, I carried a rain jacket and then I had rain pants with me and in my drop bags, I have one of everything. So people are like, wow. why do you ha- own 10 puffy jackets? I'm like, <laughs> you have to in a 200. Let me yeah, tell you. Yeah, that's fair. That's a really good five point. Five Vortex rain jacket. Yeah. Like I have lots of expensive gear, but it's like when you're doing a 200, it's, yeah. you just have to invest in that and, you know, or borrow it from friends. Cause I have a lot of stuff. And I tell my friends, if you guys need extra stuff, I, you know, have one of every color, <laughs> but of course, yeah. why not? Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, you, it's really important other than the more elite people that are going for the win, they all will have yeah. their crew and they, it's important that they have their stuff where they need it. But you know, when you're middle of the pack, back of the pack and these 200s, put something in every drop bag. Cause you could, the first time I did Bigfoot, I didn't time it right. And all of the gear I needed was at the wrong aid station. Cause I thought I was going to be faster. And my boyfriend was having problems. So I caught up to him and then he had to sleep on the trail. So I stayed with him and slept and froze because I wasn't going to get to my warm stuff, but he gave me like a, a, he had a poncho or something with him. So I stayed with him cause he was dizzy and he was having yeah. some issues. So we got to the aid station and I was going to go on cause he was going to drop and I ended up having to drop cause I didn't have, it was then going to be like a hundred degrees and all I had was warm clothing, like uh, nothing yeah, that I could yeah. go. At. And then the next aid station was going to have the wrong clothing there. It would have my, ne- you know, cause I was going to be now at night yeah, when that's I got right. there yeah. I need night gear. So, so I yeah. just ended up dropping with him cause otherwise he would have had to wait for a few days for me to finish. And I was just like, it's not that I yeah. lived and learned I, now I know to put one of everything. Yeah. I really like that so strategy. A, That's a good idea. Yeah. And, and it's overpacking. Cause I, you yep. know, when I had my crew at Moab, they're just like, yeah. Oh my God. And my friend Katie I, I, lives here. Yeah. <laughs> and I even had like clothing container in the car too. They're like, you got so much stuff and you're dropping, but I it's go, better to have it down? and not need it not than need it, it exactly. and not have it. Yeah. And I have yeah. given stuff to people to use cause they'll yeah. be coming in and I'll be with my crew and, I'll hear somebody like, oh, I don't have my jacket here. And I'm like, give them a jacket, give them yeah. one of mine. I'll get oh, it back. That's right. Yeah. You know, so I've helped people out. So, yeah. and you know, that's why I have it. You know, I always have an extra light with me. I carry a few with me, you yeah. know, little emergency ones. And I've come across runners. I'm like, just send it to me. We'll figure it out. You know, yeah. we'll get it back. I'm sure most people know that they can find you to send stuff yeah. back. So. <laughs> exactly. And, yeah. <laughs> fine. Yeah. Um, and so how do you fuel for, say a hundred miler as opposed to a 200 miler. So a hundred miler, I can pretty much get through one using Telwin, which has a lot of calories and then mm. doing my gels and eating like fruit and stuff and mm. occasionally like salty snacks. Um, but in 200, you actually sit down and eat. They make, okay. you come in and they're, you know, they don't have a bunch of 
food sitting out because it's like hours, you know, you don't know when yeah. people are coming in. So they'll say, what do you want? Okay, couch or you want a vegan burger? You know, we'll whip one up. They know what I want. And they have usually have a menu of what they have. Oh, wow. So when you come in, you can say you want a vegan hot dog or regular hot dog, a vegan burger or regular burger gluten-free bun or regular bun, you know, I'm gluten-free vegan too. So <laughs> they have everything and I usually eat the same things there. I'll have a couple of probably about three or four vegan patties and I just have the patty by itself usually. Yeah. And then I'll have lentil soup and what else do I usually own? They have usually vegan mashed potatoes. So they have a lot of good stuff. So I'll pile everything together and eat it. So I'm getting a lot of calories. So yeah. you calorie up when you get into the aid station, because you may be like eight hours to the next aid station. Yeah. So that's how you have to do it. So you learn like quickly, like, ah, oh, that's a long ways. I got to go 20 miles or 25 yeah. miles. Tahoe, I think we have quite a few 20, 20, 20 to 24 mile stretches of no aid station. So if you're so just you eating a, a whole heap, then like, you know, halfway through, you say maybe it's eight hours, so at about four hours, do you have something just... Do you have any? Yeah, usually every hour I try to do a gel. Like I yeah. use usually some kind of something, little calories yeah. and stuff. Every every hour I try to, or every two hours. So yeah. I do carry that stuff with me. I'll carry almond butter packets because they're high okay. calorie. Yeah. So so if I need calories, so I'll just have those and they're easy to carry with me. So yeah. So and yeah, I'm, in between you don't really need a lot because no, that's good. you're fueling up and getting as you know, calories. And then you kind of hike out and everything's digesting and you're fine, you know, cause you yeah. may be climbing up a hill. So it's not like you're like in a hundred mile, you're running a lot of it and you're, you know, so yeah. you can't, you can't be eating a ton of food cause it's not going to digest, but it's important to get calories in, especially in a 200 mile race. Cause you're out there multiple days. Yeah. So it's like you, it's really important. And I, for me, myself, it's like important early on for me to eat because Towards the end, I'm not eating. Maybe the last yeah. day, even my my crew is like, yeah, eat. I'm like, I just don't want to eat anymore. You know, <laughs> and I get to a gel. Of, Hang on, you I, just you, they can't argue with me. At that point, I'm like, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> but I know yeah. later I look back and I'm like, yeah, you know what? You just choke choke it down, choke yeah. the gel down, choke the almond butter pack. But it's down. easy to it's say that, but but in the moment, it's much harder to do. Yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> and you're just over it. You're like, yeah. I just want to be that. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> At some point, sometimes I'm not like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, I read on on your website that you say that you run every day. I do. So, yeah. So do you, so I've you been on a running streak for eight years now. Eight years. So. Holy moly. Yeah. <laughs> and so what's, what's like, the and it's minimum? one mile a day. Ah, okay. So a mile, but most of the time it's three miles for me because I take yeah. my dogs out every day and yeah. my senior dog who has run five fifty K's Truman, he's only doing three to six miles now. And, it, and mm. you know, it's like, He's running the whole time and I could be walking next to him and his little legs are still going like <laughs> yeah. trot, but he's slowed down a lot. So we take him out, me and Baxter, my uh, younger dog, who's 18 months, we go out with Truman for three or six miles and then bring him home. And then me and Baxter's up to 10 miles now. And oh, wow. he's, cool. he did his first back to back last week, two oh, 10 really? mile or back to backs in the mountains. So he's wow. going to be the next ultra dachshund. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. I mean, I'm just surprised that that, that kind of dog can run that far. I didn't think I they could. <laughs> Most people don't know that. Right? Yeah. I mean, all dogs like running and it's like, I've always had dachshunds and they, they run and hike, you know, they were nothing like Truman. Like Truman has been like the wonder dog. Like he, you know, and I've taken him to the vets and he gets a spine x-ray and all of that, you know, and he, now yeah. he's retired. He's almost 15, but he's still running three miles a day. And wow. I thought, well, you know, when I got Baxter, I'm like, who knows? Maybe he'll want to run. Maybe he won't. And just watching Truman, he, Baxter learned from Truman. And Truman, yeah. Baxter loves Baxter loves going in the mountains. He climbs up every rock and boulder. He goes off to the side of the trail. So, but yeah, wiener dogs, you'd be surprised <laughs> yeah. what they can do. It's like I, <laughs> Truman, you know, never got the memo that he wasn't supposed to run <laughs> 50Ks with four inch legs. And that's the you other know? thing, like they're little, like how do they navigate the trail? <laughs> Is it, they're low to the ground. So think about it. They can weave yes, it around. I mean, when there's larger things for them to go over, which is not good for them to jump off of stuff, mm. that's the main problem where there's, they can get spine uh, issues. Okay. 
is yeah. from going down because it compresses. So going up and actually running them, my vet said is probably the best thing you can do. Most dachshunds, people see them, they're overweight. Yeah, true. People just feed them and give them treats and don't exercise them because they assume you can't do that. And, yeah. you know, having him, everybody that owns dachshunds now, I'm always getting emails. These other runners are like, I, you know, I run with my cattle dog and I never thought to take my <laughs> dachshund for a run. And yeah. you're like, the Truman and Baxter were like, you know, now we're running with our little dog. And I, and I always just tell people, get a spine x-ray just to make sure that they don't have an underlying condition. And I get just like a full body x-ray. It's not that expensive. And everybody that wants to start a running program, I feel if they have a dog, it's the best investment just to do that. So you know if they're going to have an issue, they may have been born with a genetic issue. Cause I did have a wiener dog that was born with a genetic issue with his back leg, but he never, that one hardly ever ran. He mostly yeah. walked, but you know, had I tried to run him, it would have made it worse earlier on. So yeah. with that said, just getting an x-ray and then, you know, dogs are dogs. A little dog can do as much as a big dog, you know, yeah. you just have to monitor them like you would and train them like you would train yourself, you know, start out easy and build them up. Yeah. Yeah. So in saying that, how do you train specifically for races? Me, myself, yeah. mm. <laughs> I'm always trained. So I don't really have to train. Yeah. So yeah. I've always, I know people ask me that all the time and I'm like, you know what? In the, you know, in the summer, I'm always running, you know, a hundred to 120 mile weeks just wow. because I, especially really? where I live now being in the mountains. Oh Yeah. And I've always trained like that eight, between 80 and 120 miles a week. And this and, year and, I was running a lot more because we were having these virtual races running yeah. across the United States. And I mean, I was doing 200 mile weeks. <laughs> wow. And, and that's insane. in the mountains too. That's not just on the road, yeah. is it? You know, and I'll run from my house to the trails and then I can just be on trails for days and going up and down the mountain. So, so but, you must spend a lot of time out in the mountains. I do, you know, in the winter, once it starts snowing, you can't get up in the Eastern Sierra, but mm. right now it's been so weird. So yeah, last year, year before we had a high snow years yeah. and we, I went up running last Friday where I have never gone up there in December. I'm wow. in snowshoes. If I want to even go anywhere near this trail and I was able to do this whole loop. I mean, wow. all the, the lakes were frozen and it was freezing up there. I was like, Oh my God, it's like 10 degrees <laughs> out here. Like, and, you know, in certain sections, because we started really early and I said, if I ever come out here again before it snows, I am going to wait till like nine o'clock to start going up <laughs> that trail because it's too freaking cold. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I run flatter in the um, winter, but we have, I mean, my flat stuff, I go on another mountain range side where the sun is warmer okay. over there and it doesn't get snow except for higher up. Yeah. And I have like a 25 hundred foot climb that I can do and I can do repeats up that and it's steep. Yeah. It's not just, you know, it's not like a switchbacky thing. It's like ugh, hands on your knees, kind of like some of it here, like wow. hands on the rock. <laughs> so yeah, I can yeah. do repeats. So there's loops I can do here. Like I went out and took Baxter on Saturday and we did this loop and got in almost 3000 foot of climbing in 10 miles. So, oh, wow. That's yeah. Good. So my lower climbs are, you know, it's, I'm still climbing. <laughs> I'm yeah, just not yeah. going up in high altitude, like up to yeah. 11,000 and 12,000 feet. So you talked fun. about, yeah, you talked about doing repeats. Do you do much speed work and that sort of stuff or any? Do I do what? Speed work. I didn't. No, <laughs> I never have. And you know what? And this, I always say, maybe that's why I've never been injured because I wasn't a natural. Yeah. Runner. It didn't come easy for me. And I guess just because I've been ever, I mean, I've done like a 333 marathon, but that's not extremely fast. But, no, but it's good. You know, it's and a I always good did them around time. four hours. Yeah. yeah. But I guess just never being super fast like that. And now I have, um, what? Well, it's not, I was something that I was born with. I have mitral valve prolapse. So I think if I did try to be, do speed work, it would probably make my heart worse. It's never affected me. And my yeah. cardiologist is always amazed at what I do. Cause he thinks like running 200 miles is running like a marathon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <No. laughs> I go, that's why he goes, I'm worried about it, you damaging your heart. And I go, he goes, but it's not getting damaged. And I go, mm. no, because I'm not running like, you know, a 10 K at, you know, no, that's right. Five and a half minutes, six minute miles. And no. so he's finally understanding. He goes, I think a lot of it is to do with you being vegan and 
not running super fast like that. But I think as I've gotten older that if I did do that, it, maybe it would have affected me more. And well, so that, that's I've true. I mean, been, yeah, you often hear that speed work does injure people. So, yeah. You know, yeah. And, and my and friends that, yeah. that are super fast, a lot of them that are my age, they're not running like I yeah. am. They're not doing long stuff. I mean, they're doing like a 10 K now or, you yeah. know, half marathons because they've been continually injured. And a lot of those people too, didn't lift weights or do, yeah. you know, cross training. So, yeah. and that's important. Yeah. And like I said, as you get older, it's like more important to do that. Yeah. And so, you know, I hope I can run to be a hundred years old. If I live to be a hundred, yeah. you know, yeah. I'll be 56 this month. And yeah. Like I said, I haven't had any injuries, so, you know, that's, nothing that's big. amazing. Yeah. So, and, and I think a lot of that longevity is because I haven't been like super fast, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and this mitro valve prolapse, what, what is, how did you know to get diagnosed? Like, how did you know to go to the doctor? What is it? Well, I was getting a physical and it showed up that I had this weird, um, um, car, uh, when she did the, uh, not echocardiogram. What did she do? She did some heart thing and she was able to see that it was like making weird lines. So she went down the hall, my doctor, to talk to the cardiologist and showed mm. him, you know, the thing. And he was like, oh, I need to see her. She needs to do a stress test mm. to see what's going on. Because he couldn't tell until I did yeah. a stress test. So I did a stress test and then I got an echocardiogram and it showed that I had a mitral valve prolapse and my mother had it. She's passed away. Oh, okay. And she, so they think I was born with it because it's never showed up. It doesn't affect me running. Yeah. Like I don't get all these issues of shortness of breath and stuff. I mean, when he's at, when he asked me, he goes, do you have this, this, and this? And I was like, well, when I run a hundred miles, yeah, that happens. <laughs> so yeah. I go, but it happens to everybody. Yeah, that's right. So I've been seeing him for probably 10 years when I got diagnosed with it. And it's mm. like I said, it never affected me, but for a while, um, and actually a lot of runners get it as they get older and it's women are known to get it athletic okay. women that are athletes and you don't, it's not like you're going to die of a heart attack because you have mitral valve prolapse. That's not the kind of thing that it is. It's just your valve doesn't close correctly. Instead of it going doot doot like this, it kind of swings in. Oh, so, okay. and I had, so something actually developed a few years ago and it was called the regurgitation. So the blood was going in and was not coming out. Okay. And it was happening for a while, but once again, I'm like, I don't feel anything. I mean, yeah. I don't feel like I've, you know, when he was asking me questions. And so he said, he goes, well, we might have to put you on medication. And I was like, what? Yeah. I go, will that affect my running? And he goes, probably. And I was like, oh no. So yeah. at the time I was working for Whole Foods Market and I worked in nutrition and I was like, I'm taking every supplement that's supposed to be for heart health. Yeah. everything, like every herb, everything I can find. And I did it. So I made up this whole, you know, different mix of stuff I was taking. And so three months later, when I went back to him or it was no, six months and I went for my echo again and my, and it didn't show up, you oh, know, wow, that's or, no, it was a year later. It showed up. It was showing up twice in the same year. And then yeah. a year and a half later, right before I was running bad water, it went away and it's never showed back up. But that's, that's awesome. Go, yeah. And I try to tell him, I'm like, it's because I took all these supplements. And he goes, well, I don't know about that. He's very conservative. <laughs> and I'm like, whatever. And he yeah. goes, no, just, you're just healthy and you, your cholesterol's low and all of that. So yeah. no, it hasn't well, bothered me. Yeah. So. You know, yeah. And so um, you talked about cross training. So you do weights. What do you do any other sorts of cross training? Nope. Just, I do like CrossFit mini workouts, you know, yeah. I do burpees and things like yeah. that, full body workouts and plyometrics, yeah. which are really important. Yeah. I have like a yeah. box where I could do a box jump and stuff like that and pull up yeah. bar and all of that. So I do jumping pull ups. And so yeah. yeah, just like a basic little routine and, you know, and I mix it up. So, yeah. and my brother's a personal trainer, so I'll have him come up with stuff for me. I mean, he doesn't live close by. I used to work out with him when I lived in the Bay area. So, so, but he always comes up with good workouts for me. Cause I'm like, okay, I've been doing this one for a year now. Give me something new. <laughs> yeah. No, that's good. And, and, um, certain yeah. plyometrics are, are really, really important to keep the elasticity. I think that they for sure are, especially yeah. the older you get, people yeah, exactly. become not so limber and there's, that's yeah. why they get injured because yep they are not limber. Your body doesn't move the same as you were younger and it gets mm. tight and that's yes. how you get injured from the tightness. Yes. 
Yeah, no, no, I, I totally agree. So <laughs> speaking of those um, 100 milers and 200s, which one was your favourite 100 miler and what's been your favourite 200 miler? My favourite 100 miler, I would say, uh, I, I love Hurt 100 in Hawaii. That's probably, yes. I've done that one. Oh my God, let's see how many times. I've finished the 100 miler seven times and I've done 100K wow. a number of other. But it's in the jungle. It's hard. Yeah. Yes. It's hot. It's in January. It, if it rains, it's a muddy mess. And yeah. it's just like such a challenge. But it's so beautiful. I mean, it's just, a, it's a beautiful race. I'm really yeah, sad that they had to cancel it. Yeah, all the pictures <laughs> is of those slippery roots and all that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of roots and rocks. Yeah, yeah. So it's definitely a challenge. And then yeah. of 200s would be Bigfoot in Washington. And actually yeah. that out of any race I've ever done, that is my favorite race. Oh, okay. Why? You're going around a volcano. So Mount oh, wow. St. Helens, which are yeah. erupted, you know, a yeah. long time ago, but it's just like this law lava rock. And I mean, it's like your hand over fist climbing yeah. and you're climbing up ropes to get up to, you oh, know, wow. to get over and going through uh, rivers. And yeah, it's definitely, it's, and it's beautiful. Just the scenery just out there is just incredibly, it's incredible. It's, yeah. it's my favorite race, but yeah, it's scary. I mean, it has drop-offs too. Like if oh, wow. some of the stuff, if you could see in the day, you would be terrified. <laughs> like they, I mean, I tell people if you're afraid of heights or falling, oh, really? I mean, there's sections the trail, you're like on a side of a mountain and it's barely anything for your feet to connect to. And you just like, okay, take a deep breath and just go for it. Don't slip, don't fall. Cause if you do, you're going to get really hurt and you could die. I'm surprised <laughs> they're allowed to have a race there. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, you just have to be careful when you're going across stuff. I just, I, mean, I can't imagine. It's um, a trail. People hike, yeah. people hike yeah. the trail. Yeah, I suppose. So they're yeah. going with backpacks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. parts of the Pacific Crest Trail. When I hiked that, I was yeah. terrified. I'm like, if I fall and die right here, nobody's going to see me. I mean, yeah. I mean, and I'm carrying a pack. So if you lean yeah. one way, but of course. yeah, it's yeah. a, it's a, it's a, a trail that people hike on. So yeah. Yeah. You yeah. just have to be careful. But if you're definitely afraid of heights that it, I've known people that have gotten stuck over there just like, oh. you know, it's like you've oh, got to wow. go across. You have no choice, you know. And what so, if you're – some if, years I think it's better than the others. It depends on like uh, okay. if they've had a really bad rain year and it yeah. wipes the trail out and they haven't gone out to work on it. But usually they – when they're marking the trail, they try to make it a little easier for us to go through sections that are a little bit gnarly. So. And, and some of those gnarly sections, those steep sections, are they, are they done when you're sleep deprived? Uh, yeah, well, that the 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 first one you're not that sleep deprived on the one with the mm. kind of like slippery drop off. I think it's on day one and a half. <laughs> and well, it could be a bit through yeah. there, but the rest of it, it's like if you, I mean, the trail is only so wide, and the mountains on this side, and then the drop offs on this side. I always tell people lean to your lap, like <laughs> lean into the mountain, and yeah. when you're tired and you're stumbling around. You don't realize what's down there until you flash your light and you're like, oh. whoa, that's a ways down. So yeah. nobody's ever, you know, nobody's ever died yet. Thank God, <laughs> you know, but yeah, that's why it's really important you sleep so you can focus yes. in the trekking poles, you know, help. Yeah, that so, would help. Yeah. Those times, like even in the day when I can see down there, I'm like, stay to the left, you know, you're tired and you're stumbling. Yeah. yeah. So um, how is the whole COVID year? you know, kind of waste of a year, whatever, affected your training and your mindset and that sort of thing? It really hasn't. Um, there's, oh, good. We have all these virtual runs. So I've been doing a lot of those, you know, so do, mm. I've done two 200 mile virtual runs and I've oh, done wow. six 100 milers. I did like a vertical challenge. I've done, yeah. So I've done a lot. Yeah, <laughs> done, that's great. Like, and I've done official races. I did a 50K, a 100 miler before COVID. And then after, during COVID, I did uh, Moab 240, which just happened in October. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then I'm signed up for a 10 day because this last year, last year I did the across the years 10 day in Arizona. And uh -huh. so obviously they can't have it because it's on a mile looped course and there's people are too close together. Yeah. So this year they're having what's called the 10 day virtual race across the globe. So I'm going to try to do 500 miles. That was my goal last year. And I did 
400 and something because I had my dogs with me and I had to keep stopping and taking care of them. And, but I knew that when I brought, yeah. I rented a trailer last year. So that way I can go in and out of the trailer to sleep and take care of them. Yeah. So I'm doing it with a bunch of, well, not everybody's doing the 10 day, but I have a couple other friends that are signed up for it. So we're going to do it here in Bishop up and set up a camp spot up on this um, place that's called uh, Casa Diablo range. And we'll do out yeah. and backs. So I have it figured out where I can drop like some water and supplies in a tent, like five miles out. And then a friend of mine, uh, wife, she's going to be like 10 miles out. So we can have like in between dur just during the day. And then at night, we'll just do five mile out and backs. But, yeah, and yeah. we can loop around and do other stuff. I'm actually been looking at the map because I'm like, oh, okay, I want to mix it up and add some loops in there too. Yeah. But we could do whatever we want. Everybody's got their own Garmin watch and they can yeah. just, you know, put their data in each day, how many miles they go. But for me, the first 56 hours, I'm doing it as my birthday run because every year ah, since cool. I turned 40, I started doing hours for age. Yeah. So when I was 40, I started that and then I did it, you know, and I was like, okay, I'll do it until I'm 50. And then when I turn 50, I'm going to stop doing that. And then people are like, are you doing your 51 hours <laughs> now? And then it was like, it just kept going. So here we go again. So <laughs> most, most people do miles for their age. You have to take it that step further exactly. and do hours. <laughs> I like yeah. that. <laughs> oh, That's great. I wish it was 24 again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't we all? <laughs> Actually, I don't. But it makes, uh, it, you know, and it gives me motivation to do it now because yeah. I'm doing it with that 10 day. And I did, that's what I did last year when I did the 10 yeah. day. I was like, I might as well just do it on the 28th because my birthday's Christmas Eve. Oh, and so nice. I never do it on my actual birthday. I always have yeah. to do it before, like a week or so ahead. So yeah. now I can just do it on the 28th and yeah. run straight through, move for 56 hours and then take a nap and then yeah. do, then try to just do 50 miles a day. So, so will you do that 56 hours without a nap? Oh, I'll try sleep. to. Without I usually do. Actually, the older I get, I have been napping a little bit more. Yeah. So I think I will take a couple hour nap in between, yeah. like yeah. when it gets really cold. That's, that's <laughs> a long time. It is. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you recently put out your book called Reborn on the Run. What prompted you to write the book? Everybody kept telling me, you should write a book. You should write a book. You have all these stories. You've been through so much. And, yeah. and I've always wanted to. And I'm like, you know, if I could just help one person with my story, which I know it, I get emails all the time. People yeah. are like, thank you. You helped me you know, I quit drinking. I started running. I'm running 200 miler because you, I'm running a hundred miler. And these are people that never even ran. Yeah. So, I mean, if I could just help people like that and, you know, it, I just wanted to get my story out there to show others that, you know, they're not alone. And if they're yeah. going through struggles, I've been through the same thing. And if I could pick myself up and find something I'm passionate about, they can too. So. Yeah, oh, that's great. Well, and we were discussing this before we started recording. It's been going so well. You've sold out, basically. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's been out for a few years now. So, okay, yeah, yeah. and the publisher is See, isn't that funny? Out, right? I've only heard about it recently. Well, I mean, more, you know, you've, how long have you heard about me recently, too? <laughs> oh, no, I've heard about you for a while. But, yeah, I oh. haven't heard of, yeah, yeah, but I hadn't heard about the book, so... You guys are slow in Australia. Yeah, must be. <laughs> <That's> like, <laughs> yeah. Must be. Uh, well, but it is, it is true to a certain extent is that it's a, a different, obviously a different running scene, different groups of people. And so yeah. we don't necessarily, but, um, but certainly I, I know um, uh, you probably know my friend, Nikki Wind. She was at Bad Water. Of course. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And she has a wiener dog now. Her son got a wiener That's dog. That's right. I know. Yes, she does. <laughs> she immediately messaged me and I got she... a picture. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. He's crazy. He's really crazy. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's got to start getting that dog out running. <laughs> yeah. Well, she takes him out for walks now. He's still uh, mm -hmm. young, I think. So, yeah. I think, I think yeah, that's I the think plan. He's, yeah. He's younger than Baxter because I yeah. think she got him right when I got Baxter and Baxter's 18 months old now, and they usually say, wait to take them longer until they're two, but they can start yeah. training at about one years old. Yeah. I, I don't so. think he's one year yet. So yeah. That's yeah maybe he's why. cute though. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's very cute. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. You are so welcome. Yeah. I was like, Oh, am I going to be tired when I come on? <laughs> <'Cause it's late. laughs> yeah, I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I no, just have... it's totally fine. Yeah. No, so I really appreciate it. So yeah, thanks so much. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye.